Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Plot Lines. I'm your host, Connor. And before we get to today's episode, please like, share, and subscribe if you like what we're doing here at Plot Lines. And please join our Discord if you want to join our conversations. Today, I have Gavin Ashenden, the Queen's former chaplain and now lay theologian. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing exceptionally well. Thank you. It's very nice to be to be with you and to have the chance of having a conversation together. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. Uh, so you have taken a, a, a long road to get to being uh, now a Catholic, right? Yes, it's taken much too long. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm not. I'm not sure. Speaking. Uh, well, that's to the side, whether one's speaking theologically and spiritually or pragmatically. I don't think pragmatically it could have happened much quicker. Um, uh, and I dare say spiritually, I went slower than I should have done. But anyway, we're here now. Uh, it's taken a long time, but it's um, uh, it's um, uh, the, the, the accelerator is, uh, the gas pedal is hard to the floor. So all is, all is well. Good, good. Now... I, I think a lot of our listeners will be Americans, so I wonder if you could explain what the Queen's Chaplain is, uh, because I don't think a lot of them will know. Uh, it's um, the the wonderful phrase that we're uh, uh, two nations divided by a single language is is very good. The um, uh, it's not just a matter of language, but but some of the assumptions of our cultures are so very different. It's quite hard to make a translation. Um, one of the one of the aspects of English culture, which is both charming and ridiculous, is that we have a lot of historical baggage, and and a good deal of it is non-function. So this will seem amazing to Americans because um, you you got where you are today by being functional and making, <laughs> making things work. Um, but in England, in particular, we have this very strange mixture of things, which are which are decorative. So if you were going to plan a democracy or a constitution, you know, we have an unwritten one. Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't start from where we are with an unwritten one, you'd write one. And in the same way, many of the things that happen in public life have grown up over a long period of time. And sometimes they work well and sometimes they don't. Uh, so in particular, the, um, uh, the history of the royal family, which is made more complicated by the fact that from, uh, from about the seventh century, it was the royal, the royal families were Catholic by and large, increasingly mm -hmm. growing more Catholic as uh, different Saxon groups converted. Uh, and as Alfred in particular uh, unified a single Christian kingdom uh, in England and Charlemagne did in, in Europe. Um, but of course in 1515, well, so during the reign of Henry VIII, um, who, of course, was a Catholic monarch, but behaved like a Protestant. <laughs> uh, so in, in, in the middle of the 16th century, suddenly our monarchy became Protestant. But many things continued to be to look the same. And so part of the problem with being English is that we have a kind of Catholic landscape, which was taken over by a Protestant coup 500 years ago. But, but the Protestant coup intended to make to make the thing look like there was continuity. So, so Catholics in England are quite cross, really. And one of the things that they, we say, when I was an Anglican, it made me very angry. Now I say it all the time. You know, <laughs> you've stolen our cathedrals, give them back. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, you don't know how to use them, you keep on filling them with Disney worlds and uh, gin competitions and arts festivals. And, and you have no sense of the presence of the Blessed Sacrament here. So. If you don't know how to use them, then give them back because we built them and we know how to use them. But the reason this, this I'm, I'm going on this long explanation is that the, the royal ecclesiastical household went by the same route. So uh, the whole point about the royal family having chaplains was they went around saying mass. You needed about three dozen chaplains to say mass wherever the king or queen went. The, the court went and mass happened too. So of course you would have a number of chaplains to say mass. So what happened then when the when the royal family became Protestant was they weren't needed to say mass, so they were turned into preachers instead, which is ludicrous. You don't need 36 preachers, you just don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Although it's worth saying for people who are interested historically that everything we know about the Battle of Agincourt, we know from a blogging royal chaplain who sat <laughs> on the baggage train and, and he, he wrote up his blog and we still we still have it. So much of the details of the battle we have because a royal chaplain was there and he kept a record of it. And um, so, so we know that the royal ecclesiastical household goes back at least that far. Uh, in, in that particular mode of being. Then, um, once the royal family became Protestant, the, uh, it was based in, there were a number of palaces, there's Buckingham Palace, but there's also a place called St. James's Palace, and the royal chaplains were based there. Uh, and everyone thinks that, um, that the royal family are sort of in a single place with a single court, but it isn't the case. The, there is, for example, Westminster Abbey, which is a which, which was an abbey, and then it stopped being an abbey when the Protestants hijacked it and took, had their coup, and said so it became a big building. But it lives under, it's personally answerable to the Queen, but the people who run it are not the royal chaplains. And this sounds a bit weird. You, you'd think they would be. You'd think the, <laughs> the kind of royal chaplaincy corps would be devolved, like the special boat service or the seals, you know, to go. But, but on the contrary, it's a separate group who run the abbey. And then there's St. Paul's Cathedral, and uh, the chaplains are all based in St. James's Palace, where there are two chapels, one for the summer and one for the winter. You know, you wouldn't invent it like that, but that's how it is. <laughs> and then the, the, the ambassadors who pay, who come and uh, come to the court of the Queen, for some strange reason, they're based at St. James's Palace, not Buckingham Palace, where the Queen is, but St. James's Palace, where on the whole she isn't. <laughs> and uh, um, so this, this is all, a, a sort of way in which the whole thing grew up historically. So the chaplains all preach in the chapel at St. James's Palace. And anyway, when she's in London, she's normally at Buckingham Palace, not St. James's Palace. Uh, and anyway, at the weekend, she leaves London and she goes to Sandringham or to Windsor. So the one place where the Queen is not on Sundays is where the royal chaplains are. It's ludicrous. <laughs> um, however, uh, one of the things that happens is that royal chaplains are invited to uh, to receptions and to events. And um, uh, so in that way, they get to know the royal family a bit. So then the next problem comes that if you were, a, if as a royal chaplain, you got to know the Queen or the Duke, uh, uh, um, the Duke of Membra, as, as he was, uh, or Charles or any other member of the royal family, you wouldn't ever be able to talk about it because nobody would ever trust you so you'd you'd have to not tell anybody <laughs> so i i i uh, i'm not able to to talk about pastoral encounters because that would be a, a breach of confidence and a breach of a, a breach of the whole system but but if as a royal chaplain you've been there for a few years and if they like you then you get to have conversations and out of the conversations um things that have to do with the kingdom of heaven and their souls can happen but you can't talk about it yeah, that makes sense that, you know, privacy and all all that uh, would be a crucial part of that job. Uh, well, one of the things I can talk about, I think, because because it happened, was the um, one of the stories <laughs> I'm able to tell was the day in which uh, about a month, two months before I was due to preach uh, in St. James's Palace, not, not knowing who would be there. So the ambassadors turn up there. The, the, the Queen's uh, ladies-in-waiting turn up. Um, lots of people to do with the court are, are there. Um, and uh, I got phoned up by the palace, and they said, you can't go and preach to the Queen on your appointment in about two months' time. And I said, why not? And they said, because MI5 have phoned us and said that the Muslims plan to assassinate you. <laughs> saying things in the, in, in the newspapers about the Quran, which I... I had been. The, the newspapers would phone me up from time to time and ask me theological questions about Islam, which I was qualified to answer and, and did answer. But of course, as you know, over the last 10 years, there are a number of things you're not allowed to talk about in the public space. And increasingly, they are Islam and, uh, and issues of human sexuality. And if you answer, if you tell the truth about either of those two things, you know, now we've moved from issues to human sexuality to the whole trans activist. Um, uh, categories then then you get cancelled or, or so this was slowly developing uh, but in the meantime i was talking uh, uh, about these things 
And so I did get cancelled because MI5 said you can't come. And also because uh, if they were to be believed, there was an Islamic group who wanted to cancel me permanently. <laughs> anyway, I objected. I objected and said, I, I, I insist on coming. I have a right uh, to come. I'm a member of the royal household. And, and I don't think, you know, I, 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 um, I'd like to exercise my right to be there. And they said, well, you don't really have a right. You're there at the Queen's invitation. And, um, and basically, uh, she doesn't want to have to pay to replace all the carpets in case you're martyred on them. So you know, <laughs> don't, don't annoy the Queen and don't, don't please don't come. So I thought this is perfectly reasonable. The, queen, the Queen's entitled uh, to care for um, her carpets. And of course, that's a sort of an English way of, of uh, saying... Uh, the matter is enormously serious and, and we're not going to let it happen. Translated yeah. into kind of typical English understatement, we don't want blood on the carpets and have to pay for dry cleaning bills. Um, it's as, so funny. As, as it happened, the, uh, uh, the excitement about my coming um, diminished and then my five took the view that the assassination plot wasn't serious. It was just a moment of, of annoyance uh, expressed in that way. So I did go. I did preach, and I, they, they, uh, I, I wasn't assassinated, and the Queen didn't have a, a bill for her carpets. So there <laughs> you go. That's that's what, one of the stories that happened during my time there. Where would you preach to the Queen? Like, where where would that take place? If she if she, if she came, uh, uh, so I mean, if she if she came, it would be in either the summer chapel or the winter chapel. Okay. Most of the people who preached to the Queen preached either at Sandringham where her country estate was, or Windsor, uh, or Westminster Abbey. But, but ridiculously, the royal chaplains never preached at Sandringham or Windsor or Westminster Abbey. We only preached in St. James's Palace, where she almost never went. So is St. James a fake palace in some ways? Well, it's not a fake palace, it, but, but I mean, it, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's used for a whole load of other things, but... Um, uh, so there are a whole lot of people who live in it, and and it, and it's it's one of it's, it's it's like it's a branch of the royal family. Um, so things so things do happen there. Uh, f- fake is not the right word. But okay. Peripheral, might, peripheral, peripheral to the queen and to the and, and to the duke might be the best way of describing it. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you had a very interesting uh, experience in the Church of England. Outside of just being that, were you were a bishop at one point? Were you not? Well, yeah, I was, but it wasn't in the Church of England. It was um, in the continuing Anglican Church. Uh, so w- one of the things that happened was, um, uh, I I suppose around about the year two thousand, I was I was ethically very liberal, though theologically cr- creedally conservative, um, and. Uh, I was ethically liberal partly because I was working as a senior lecturer and a chaplain running an interfaith team in one of our more radical universities. And uh, and I guess I probably fell for the baited hook about compassionate liberalism. Um, I, I can explain why it was a mistake, but the the uh, one can either major on on the on the category error, uh, or one can celebrate the fact that I slowly saw the error of my ways. The Holy Spirit helped me. And also, I have to say, a very good Catholic priest friend who was a, an exorcist. Um, and also the fact that the, the narratives of the, of, uh, of the um, progressive community uh, didn't stand up to scrutiny. As you say, so increasingly as the years went by, I discovered that what I was being presented with uh, the, the, the gritty reality of what I had been presented with was not what was being presented in the public space as a way of celebrating diverse sexual identities. That's <laughs> a, the uh, most polite way of saying it. But be that as it may, I, 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 I then began to change my mind and re-adopt uh, a, a traditionalist ethical approach. But the problem with that was that the people in charge of the Church of England were very much committed to the progressive trajectory and so um as as they as it was realized that i was becoming more traditionalist i became 
less and less acceptable to the establishment. I mean, you might say I became less less acceptable because people, some people either didn't like me or they found I thought I wasn't very good at what I was doing. Um, uh, and, and those might be true, but but it seemed to me much more a case that uh, you would progress into the higher echelons of the church if you believed the right things, and I no longer believed in them. So one of the things that happened was that uh, a group of American Anglicans said, we can see that you're becoming more conservative. And we, we have this plan to save the Church of England. And we would like to, we'd like to sort of fly in three missionary bishops, all of whom have Catholic Episcopal orders, which come from a rather colorful Catholic bishop of Brazil called Duarte Costa in uh, the end of the Second World War, who fell out with the Vatican over over the influx of Nazis, which he believed Rome was facilitating. Though I think historically, we would not blame Rome for that now, but, but at the time, a number of people were not at all clear about Rome's relationship with fascism uh, at the end of the Second World War. I mean, what we now know if, if, if it's, is that um, when the Pope spoke out against Hitler uh, and what he was doing, uh, a particular village was simply erased uh, and, and the inhabitants were all killed. And the, the German high command said to the Pope, if you criticize us publicly again, we'll do that again. We've only just started. And inevitably, of course, the Pope saw that other people would pay the price for any public comments he made. So he made few public comments after that. And, and therefore people, um, <coughs> the, 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 over the last 60 or 70 years, people have been critical about the Pope's public stance. In actual fact, as a scholarship is showing, he worked enormously hard behind the scenes, covertly, uh, in order to undermine the Nazi regime. But this wasn't clear at the time, and it's taken a while to break surface. So back to the main story. Duarte Costa fell out with the Vatican, and um, uh, his secretary was told to smuggle his resignation into his morning paper in about 1946. So he signed all his papers and then discovered he'd resigned from his episcopate <laughs> and was, was given a titular episcopate. And he then got very cross and founded the Independent Catholic Church of Brazil. Uh, and he then went on to consecrate some Episcopalian bishops who were then in tactile Catholic succession. So now this is an example. Of, I mean, there's a, there's a, dispute, a debate, a dispute about the extent to which tactile succession uh, how long it lasts and how and how um how valid it it, it is um but, but for the episcopalians uh who wanted to to place some anglican missionary bishops in the church of england on the grounds that the church of england was going to to, to slowly die and also lose contact with its own conservative adherents this wasn't a bad plan um and and in on paper it should have worked so I accepted the invitation, knowing that it was extremely eccentric and was, uh, in many ways, an unwise thing to do. But it seemed to me that there was some possibility that Kingdom of Heaven might be served by it. But after about five years, one of the things I realized was that without a magisterium, it was impossible to unite, to have a, to have a, uh, it was impossible to have a, a united Anglican view on anything. So even, even for those people who were conservative-minded in terms of scripture and tradition, uh, even if you could overcome egos, political agendas, misunderstanding, you had to have recourse to a magisterium. Otherwise, there was no way of having a united church. Uh, now, you might have thought I should have known that before I started, and perhaps I should, but I certainly found it out after I'd started. And so after four or five years of trying to, to, to play my part in drawing a disparate Anglican opposition together, uh, I realized it couldn't be done. And about and at that point, my local Catholic bishop said, we strongly suspect you're really completely Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. we, we, we need you on the team, you come over. Uh, and as I prayed and thought about it, uh, the answer was obviously, yes, I, I must and I should. This, this experiment that I've set about trying to manage is never, ever going to work. Um, and uh, so I said yes, and I became a Roman Catholic. Thank God. <laughs> yes, I do. I do. I'm. I'm. Um, I have to say, I remain completely thrilled about being Catholic. Um, 
it won't surprise anyone to know that that I have reservations about the uh, the people who are running the church. They're a mixed <laughs> bunch, as they always have been, uh, and there's no need to say any more than that. Everyone knows what I mean. But but it, nothing stops me from being thrilled to be in communion with Rome, and above all, to be in communion with Saint Anselm and Thomas of Becket and Saint Augustine and Ecure Dar and 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 Saint, Saint John Henry Newman and you know the whole list of them. I'm I'm absolutely thrilled, and also wonderfully to be able to go to mass without a scintilla of doubt about what's happening. Uh, and that that is just such a relief. Um, it's a bit like domestic abuse, I think. Um, the, 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 the moment you, 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 know, you, you walk away from it and you, you stop it, you suddenly run, why on earth did I sign up to all this? This is, what, what, could I not see earlier on that this was a form of madness? And I'm afraid I think Anglicanism is a form of theological madness. Um, and uh, I, 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 I remember hearing one convert on YouTube, a lovely elderly man say, I'm so grateful for my time in the Church of England. I will never... I will repay my gratitude by never saying anything critical against it. And I thought, do you know, that's a really holy attitude. I like that. A sane and kind man would take that attitude. But on the other hand, <laughs> <laughs> if, if the theater is burning down, you don't do anyone any favors not to shout fire. The exits are this way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so rather than um, pretend to be holy and pretend to be nicer than I am, I'm, I'm shouting fire. The exits are this way. <laughs> Good. That makes sense. Um, so you said, you know, you're very happy to be in communion with all these different saints. Are there any specific uh, English saints that you've grown increasingly more devoted to since you've become Catholic? Yes, I should say that I'm very close to Padre Pio. Um, for reasons I, I find it hard to articulate, um, I love Padre Pio very very much indeed and uh and i'm particularly moved by the fact that he's a 20th century saint mm -hmm. kind of who reverses the, the the narrative that somehow the middle ages was a time of superstition uh by by uh living out uh, a life of spiritual validity uh in the in the mid 20th century uh, i think the english saints who have attracted me most are probably St. Thomas of Becket and St. John Henry Newman. Um, I'm getting to know St. John Fisher better. Uh, and, uh, but I think, I think, and I'm very fond of Anselm because of his, his theology and his prayers, but I think the reason for Newman and Becket is because the, um, they, they both found themselves in direct confrontation with a, a decaying, establishment power and they had to decide whether or not they were going to put their comfort and safety first uh, and neither of them did they were very brave prophetic figures uh, and I, and I'm not a brave prophetic figure but I I know I know one when I see one and they are um, and there are certain parallels in our time now at this moment to uh, uh, to, to their eras, and I think I think there's a lot to be said by being inspired by their discernment and their courage. So, uh, so I think that's partly why I'm I'm particularly attracted to them and ask them for their prayers. Yeah, w one that w uh, went through political martyrdom, and then uh, the other who basically went through social martyrdom, probably. Uh, yeah. Th that's that's right. I mean, so St. So, so John Henry Newman didn't have to be politically martyred, but but essentially, um, he th they both took on the establishment and said that the establishment needed to repent and needed to change, needed to to, to uh, reassess its priorities, uh, and both did so from a from a, a, a position of immense spiritual clarity. Um, uh, and in both cases, the establishment declined to repent. And so both St. Thomas and St. John Henry paid a price for it, um, as anyone will have to when they stand up against the establishment. But increasingly, um, although this applies in England to the English establishment, it, it of course is applying across the whole of the Western world as, as we find our culture decaying uh, and Christendom collapsing around our ears. 
and anyone who wants to fight for Jesus in the and and the, and the Holy Mother Church in these circumstances will have to pay a similar kind of price. Who knows exactly what it's going to be, but it's but it's the same principle. We're faced by a decadent secularism, and God has given us responsibility of of witnessing to Him and standing up against it as best we can with His help. Yeah, indeed. Do, why do people still hold on to Anglicanism? It seems very much a ho- like at, the, at at least at this point a very hollow shell. I I guess because it it occupies quite a sensible place on the spectrum between Catholicism and Protestantism. So uh, at the point where you had Luther and Zwingli and Calvin fighting about quite how far to go in the Enlightenment project of reconfiguring Christianity according to the uh, cultural prejudices of the 16th century. Uh, Calvin and and Zwingli uh, went pretty well the whole hog, so to speak. Luther held back, and um, he was conflicted in in a different way. I mean, for him, I think... Uh, I, I decided in rereading the history of the 16th century that, um, that Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, each of them were trying to work through uh, psychological, uh, political, uh, and philosophical agendas and doing it rather badly. Uh, and, and, and it's this kind of this bad filtration of these issues that led to the Reformation. A reformation that people were hungry for because there were a whole series of fault lines developing up, developing in uh, in the, the beginning of a nationalistic European society. But um, Luther, Luther, to some extent, straddled the middle ground. He kept himself proximate to the Mother Church in many ways, and Anglicanism did the same. In fact, it probably kept itself more proximate, um, and I think probably helped by the fact that it inherited the Catholic. A Catholic suit of clothes. It inherited all the churches. It inherited the offices of bishops, priests, and deacons, though it changed them, but it kept the names. So, to some extent, Anglicanism was a kind of continuity Catholicism, or at least it was a it was a it was a, a conglomeration of a concordat between different theological churches, who, for practical reasons, decided this would be the best umbrella. The, the best container, uh, the least disruptive container for a reformed kind of Christianity. So there were those who wanted uh, a more extreme reform Christianity, but those who wanted a less extreme form, the Anglicanism provided a good way of doing it. So it, it then, of course, had a prime position as being infiltrated into the social network of, of the country. So you could make an argument for saying that um, while Catholics were being horridly and very badly persecuted, still hung, drawn, and quartered and right the way through Elizabeth's reign. I mean, people being executed publicly right into the early 1600s uh, and, then, and then being socially uh, completely sacrificed until, uh, uh, until the, um, the Catholic Emancipation Act in the 19th century. So it was a terrible period of time when Catholics were treated appallingly badly. But but during that time, Anglicanism held the middle, the middle ground. And if you weren't a Catholic, it was a privileged place to be. Well, why not be in a privileged place to be if that's it was offered to you? Uh, so the Baptists and the Presbyterians were all uh, quite proud of themselves, saying, well, we've given up privilege. But then they'd also gave up influence as well. So, you know, again, there's this trade-off to be had. Do I do I, do I want to be thought of as being pure in my Reformation theology, but with no influence? Or am I willing to sacrifice a certain amount of purity of compromise and, and have influence? So Anglicanism was a position of those who wanted to sacrifice a degree of theological purity and attraction and influence and prestige, I have to say. Uh, and I think that, that there were three serious renewal movements in each century. In the 18th century, it was Wesley, uh, and, and in an astonishing way, the Church of England simply turned its back on this, this what was a very moving movement of reform, beginning with a form of Catholic sacramentalism. Uh, and then in the 19th century, uh, the whole Oxford movement tried again 
to challenge the the theological closed-mindedness of Anglicanism and to re re so I mean this Wesley had tried to reattach it to its biblical roots. Uh, John Henry Newman tried to reattach it to its ecclesial roots, back to, 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 to the, the motherhood that had given it birth. And then in the 20th century, I would say that the charismatic movement, I think now I know understand to be a kind of lay mystical movement, which was trying to attach the church back to its, to its pneumatic roots. So in a way, you almost have a Trinitarian um, uh, uh, movement of reform. Um, uh, if, if you, if you, if, if for the moment you allow Newman to, with his patristics, to represent the, 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 the father who created the church, and, and Wesley to represent, the, you know, the, the divine logos who, who gives the word its its living word, and then the charismatic movement, the uh, sort of prophetic and uh, mystical element, you can say that over three or four hundred years, the whole Holy Trinity has tried to renew the Church of England, and at every point, the Church of England said no. <laughs> We're not <laughs> going to do it. And it seems to me that that you can make a case for saying that on the final no that happened at the end of the 20th century, uh, I think I think God has, in the same way that Newman was saying, look, this is an age of apostasy. You cannot afford to rebel against God without there being consequences. I would say that the same thing is true. The same message has to be heard in the 21st century. And, and some of us are saying you are apostates. You cannot expect there to be no consequences. Um, but this is not just, in fact, the, the difference now is it's not just a matter of there being no consequences to society or the church, but our whole civilization is about to fall. And so this is a very serious moment for apostasy to take place. Uh, why do people continue to do it? I think for a number of reasons, spiritual and pragmatic. Spiritually, there has to be a kind of spiritual opening of the eyes. It's the way we do our theology and our discipleship is is not is not just an enlightenment enlightenment matter of body and mind. Uh, there has to be a pneumatic version, and very often uh, the, the Holy Spirit has to soften the heart and bring people um, uh, bring people to an awareness. And that was certainly what happened to me with my ethical liberalism. Uh, but then there's also a pragmatic view. Um, it, it still it costs you quite a lot to leave the Church of England in a privileged position, and um, some people are are not. See no reason for vacating it. But many, some, some for good reasons. They, they still continue. I think rather foolishly to think they can mend things from inside, and other people perhaps less honourably, unwilling to pay the price and face up to the fact that it can't be done. Uh, but the moment you see the moment the moment you've seen, uh, if you like, the truth about, about Catholicism in particular, you think, well, for goodness' sake, why did it take me so long <laughs> to 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 be to be clear about this? I I often reprimand myself by saying. Surely I could have got there more quickly. Don't be too hard on yourself. You got there. That's that. To be honest, that's the uh, that's the ultimate end, anyways. I, yeah. Well, there's a lovely message in the Gospels. Um, one one of a verse has become one of my favorites, and that's simply, uh, you know, he or she who, who endures to the end shall be saved. There's a lot to be said for keeping going in the marathon race that is our pilgrimage. Uh, yeah. And. Um, you know, by the grace, the grace of the Holy Spirit, one. Um, as long as you set out to live a life of repentance, then then repentance breeds grace, and grace breeds salvation, and and all is good. Yeah, we we talked about you know Beckett and Newman, sort of being the sort of you know um, physical martyrdom, and then uh, social martyrdom. I mean, you were just talking. You talked about how you experienced you know people saying that they wanted to kill you you know uh and then has there been sort of that that social m martyrdom that's come along the way too i'm told there has um i was told by some friends of mine they said how, how are you coping with the very dreadful things people are writing about you after you know, i became a catholic and I said, well, quite well, really, because I haven't read them. I, I said, well, d d d don't read them. And so on the whole, I haven't read them. Um, uh, I've been spared uh, quite a lot of the social martyrdom by, by not, well, actually, I, I haven't seen them. I haven't gone looking for them, obviously. I, I learned quite quickly never to Google myself. That, that was, <laughs> so I don't, I, don't ever, I don't ever do that. Um, I, I'm sorry to say that one loses friends. Um, 
I'd be busy trying to recapture them by saying, come with me and be become Catholics too. Um, and uh, uh, so one loses friends, uh, one loses uh, a role, one loses income. Um, and, um, but, but there's nothing I haven't given up, as always, that God hasn't replenished or replaced in some kind of way. So, it, so um, uh, I have to say that it's, you know, you exchange a whole lot of things. You exchange things you held on to that mattered, that made life easier. Uh, but when you give them up, God doesn't leave you short. Uh, it may be harder, but, but, um, uh, but it's certainly more blessed. Yeah. Is it hard to give up sort of the desire for the things you've lost? Do you know, I think it's more existential. I think you, each of us comes to understand ourselves in a certain way. Um, and certainly by, you know, if, if, if you're a kind of, I don't mean a professional, but, but, um, but you, know, you, you, you make your way, you, you make your impact in the world. And by the time you're sort of, you're 60, you say, well, this is who I am. Uh, I fought quite hard to get here. I fought a lot of battles to get here. And then, and then suddenly discover, no, it's not who you are. You've got to start all over again. <laughs> that's um, existentially, that's challenging. But I think it's, I think it's simply a, another version of our Lord saying, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. So there's, there is no point at which you, 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 um, you stop saying, well, Lord, Here's my life. Uh, uh, if, if I'm going to lose it again, okay, there we go. This is this is the deal. It, it should be no great surprise, um, and it isn't. But but um, I guess probably it must apply to everybody, all of us. That we never reach a platform where you know we are who we are and we know what we know. The, God always wants to lead us further. I and mean, I would say I think I always find it quite helpful the, the whole map, the, the map of purgation, illumination, and union. Um, it's a cyclical thing. So uh, all Christians are experiencing a degree of purgation, a degree of emission, a degree of union. I think the degrees change depending on whereabouts on the journey you are and what progress you're making. Uh, if you don't make a lot of progress, then then, then the purgation stuff stays up quite high. <laughs> but you know that 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 doesn't matter. You you perhaps is it better to do purg purgation here rather than purgatory? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I can't work it out. But the fact is, there is no shortcut to being a Christian. And, and you never know, you know, the deal simply is you love our Lord and you uh, you try and live a life of devotion, uh, discipline and repentance. And uh, we all fail. <laughs> so we fall flat on our faces, we get forgiven, then we start again. Um, and, you know, the, the, the cycle of history that you do it in, the, the place in society that you do it in, uh, the, the family dynamics that you do it in, these are all variables, but the principles are universal to us all, I think. Yeah. Would you say the Church of England still has influence? No. No? Okay. So I mean, it's, got, it's, it's got half a million people who go, so I, I should qualify that. There are half a million people who, who go to church uh, in the Church of England, and God alone knows their souls. There are clearly some very good and very faithful people amongst them. Uh, they will continue to have influence as they say their prayers and love Jesus. Uh, who they are and how, what their spiritual attraction is, isn't known to me. It's only known to the Lord. But they're there. Of course they are. The problem is that one has to make a distinction between private sanctity and uh, and the integrity of the institution. The, in the institution stinks. It's sold out completely. I mean, it really, it it really does stink. It's horrible, uh, and that's partly again because it has no magisterium. It has no, it has no handholds. Essentially, it 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 says it has the Bible, but you know, you know, we all know what people do to scriptural verses. Mm -hmm. They twist them to mean anything they like, uh, and it has these thirty nine articles, which were a a kind of um, uh, a. a, a Committee number 15's hissy fit um, in, in the 16th century. I mean, they're just a theologically and political hissy fit. Um, and again, nobody pays any attention to them. So the church says, well, we live by these things and 
this is what joins us together. But it isn't true. And it isn't even true they believe in the creeds. I mean, the Church of England has no right to say that it believes in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Because first of all, it's in schism, so it can't be one. Uh, secondly, it's not Catholic, it's Protestant. So why, why is it using that word in that sense? Secondly, it's not holy, it's, 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 it's disgusting. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the ethical values it's promoting at the moment are abhorrent to our Lord. We know they are. Um, uh, so it's not one, it's not holy, it's not Catholic, and, and it's hard to say it's a church. It's actually a group of, it's a group of, of uh, ecclesiastical-minded allegiances got together for the purposes of furthering their own interest. It's not a church. So how can they possibly say the Nicene Creed? It's nonsense. Yeah. Are you optimistic for the future of the Catholic Church in England? Well, that's a very interesting question. It really is. Um, so let's 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 do the normal thing, uh, which is to say let's let's move optimism to hope, and instead okay. of talking about a psychological attitude, let's choose a theological mm -hmm. virtue. I don't. I'm not reprimanding you. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. for the sake of clarity, that's what we need to do. So no, I agree. Uh, so. Um, so what what theological hope can we have for the Catholic Church? First of all, it's got some really wonderful people in it. Um, and secondly, the Catholic Church is 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 utterly wonderful as an institution. And thirdly, it has our Lord's promise. What will happen to it? Well, the bishops have to become a little more articulate um, and committed to Catholicism and, and less committed to uh, less committed to the um uh to the sort of carbon dioxide of of progressive secularism that has uh, affected all churches um, perhaps the orthodox least but it's you know it's ruined the it's ruined the protestant churches and it's marred the catholic church um there are two variables aren't there one is the integrity of the catholic church uh, and and the degree to which it sets out to be the catholic church one of the things i and other people are saying is look the Anglican Church has given up now. Um, so this is the moment for Catholics to stand up and say, we are the church here now. <laughs> these are our buildings, these are our concepts, this is this is our responsibility. Here we are, we're 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 taking over again, or rather, we're making a play to be the church in this country since since this Protestant state exercise has given up uh by any uh, uh mark on, on the real faith. So will the church do that? It might do. Um uh, the, part of the problem is it's been really badly psychologically undermined. Um, I, I'm, I'm in Normandy at the moment, and I, I like I like the, Catholic, the feel of the Catholic Church in France. It's much more it's much more sure of itself, much more Catholic. Um, in England, it's as if the stuffing has been knocked out of people, because for so long there was a sense that it was the Church of the lower working class immigrants. It wasn't really English. Somehow it, it, it was it was treacherous in some kind of way it didn't it didn't have an allegiance to english culture not understanding that the the, the first thousand years of, Engl of, of english culture were formed <laughs> on, the, on the bedrock of catholicism so i'd like to see the catholic church in england become a bit more confident um will will the english nation pay any attention uh probably not <laughs> the, the level of um the level of secularized brainwashing is really very, very high indeed. And it's extremely difficult as any Christian to break through the methodical uh, brainwashing that uh, what is best described as a long march through the institutions of Marxism 2.0 has constituted. So if anyone could do it, the Catholic Church can, but it may be that there is so much decadence and spiritual hardness of heart, so much spiritual corruption and rebellion in our secular society that it may choose to resist God right to the end. And that won't be the Catholic Church's fault. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. Um, is, there, uh, is there just a greater interest in the Catholic Church with the decline of the Anglican Church, or is it just... Or is everyone more interested in Islam? Well, that's again a very good question. So, um, as as so much breaks down, we're in a we're in a period now of 
of um, uh, of corporate social and psychological breakdown. People's mental health is under enormous stress, partly because they're asked to, to live in a way that is profoundly destructive to our mental stability, whether it's drugs or sexual incontinence or uh, intellectual anarchy uh, or apocalyptic terror. You know, all of these things have leverage on people's minds. Uh, we, we People are very unwell psychologically. Um, we're breaking down politically, psychologically, spiritually. So people will reach out to different places. There are lots of Anglicans still who are still reaching out to Catholicism. And I have quite a lot of people following me who, who, who write to me and say, thank you for what you say on the internet. We're slowly becoming convinced we're making our way. And others who say, yay, I've suddenly, I'm becoming a Catholic this week. So uh, in a small way, there's a group of people who are stead slowly and steadily becoming Catholics that I'm in touch with. And I know, I know that's, you know, much wider than my tiny sphere of influence. Um, inevitably, people are becoming attracted to other demanding philosophical ways of life, including uh, eco ecological apocalypticism. So the whole green movement is, is grabbing people, partly by terrifying them. Islam is working very hard to do the same. So as society breaks down, um, there are a number of different groups. Uh, I, I would say political, green, and, and, and spiritual, all bidding for the same people. Um, so yes, there's, there's, there's competition for, for people's hearts and minds and souls in this period of breakdown, which is another reason why it's very important that the Catholic Church should, should recover a new apostolate of evangelism and, uh, and self-confidence uh, so that we, we can get in there and... Um, um, continue the rescue mission that the Christian church has always been. Yeah. Word from our affiliate, Bishop Sheen Rosaries. You've probably worn through the chain of your cheap plastic rosary. Other rosaries simply can't stand up to the wear and tear of everyday life. Bishop Sheen Rosaries are made of solid metal beads and paracord to withstand any condition and are backed with a lifetime warranty. Upgrade your rosary to a Bishop Sheen rosary made to fit your lifestyle or buy one for a friend. Each rosary sold supplies two weeks of food for a school kid in Uganda. You use the exclusive link down below to help support our efforts here at Plotlines. The link will take you to sheenrosaries.com. Be sure to use the code PLOTLINES10. I know you've had a lot of experience with Anglicans in America or slash Episcopalians. What uh, advice do you have for Catholics in America um, in, you know, sort of maybe can helping to convert their uh, their Episcopalian friends? Well, I think, first of all, if if the surveys that I've read are to be believed, the first piece of advice I have for Catholics in America is to believe the faith. <laughs> <laughs> you know, believe in the mass, for goodness sake, believe in the mass, believe in the church, believe in Our Lady, believe in the miraculous. <laughs> You know, believe the faith. That's that's the first thing because too many Catholics have gone down the kind of the theological and psychological Episcopalian route of accommodating their faith to secular, uh, intellectual and cultural um, pressures. So that would be the first thing. Um, uh, and then, and then I think, I, I, I think what I'd like to say is that the the Enlightenment experiment is is bust. So I'm not sure if I believe in the categories of modernism and postmodernism. So they're, you know, they're very fluid categories. Um, uh, well, certainly we can believe in, in what's called modernity, but but the trouble is modernity is already dead. Uh, so to, there's a paradox in even calling it modernity because it sounds like it's still going on, mm -hmm. but it isn't. It's it's bust. <laughs> and postmodernity uh, suggests like it's it's it, it's uh, there's a trajectory of improvement. Uh, on the ground, on the sort of the with the teleological implications that, that post anything must be must be a development of some worth, but it's not at all. Uh, it's not at all a teleological improvement. Uh, so I think the first thing I, I want to say to Christians today is don't believe in modernity and postmodernity. Um, now, as, as it happens, there's an interesting Russian theologian uh, who who is suggesting that it's difficult to talk in complementary terms about Russians today because of what's going on in Ukraine and the, the, the dreadful tragedy of the Russian invasion. 
Um, but, but, but again, leaving that to one side for a moment, um, there's a theologian called Alexander Dugin who says that, that, that with the, the decay of Western liberalism, there needs to be a new Christian political program. Now, now whether the one that he's proposing is the right one or not, uh, we certainly need to have a new Christian political program. As I, th I probably want to say to Catholics in the West is that, that intellectually, we need to find a new way of configuring the faith uh, and offering some form of cultural Christian democratic uh, influence. Um, but, but before we can do that, we, we need to have found a way of resisting what's corrupting the church at the moment. So we have to, we have to find a way of being confident in resisting secularism uh, and, and the disbelief of the 20th century and also to regain a sense of of real metaphysical analysis of, of the, you know, the absolutism of good against evil. So those are the first things we have we have to do. Um, and, and I think that if the church did that, then then Episcopalians would look and say, oh, goodness me, this is the real church. This is real Christianity. This is the real McCoy, as, as to some extent they are doing. So the first thing I think is to find is to regain a faith in the Catholic Church as it has been always and everywhere at all times. Um, and uh, uh, and then to confront the profoundly powerful spiritual, uh, intellectual, and cultural forces that are trying to undo Christianity in our in our cultural epoch. Yeah. So culture really is the answer to these questions. Well, culture is the arena where it's taking place. Okay. So you know, our, our culture is where. Uh, the, the, the decayed Christendom, um, uh, I don't, it's, it's, it's quite complicated to describe how what was the Christian foundation of culture has evaporated, um, really, I mean, in, in a sense, especially <laughs> after the Second World War, but of course it, it, it stretched further back into the mid-19th century, but, but wherever you date the decay and the speed of the decay from uh, the cultural environment is where the fight is taking place, and you know, that in, so in terms of the way we do we do theatre and art and literature and philosophy uh, and and conversation, um, we we essentially they, they, these things have been taken over completely, and in fact Christians are effectively barred from them now, so we have to find. Uh, I, I think probably what we have to do is to is to is to go back underground, almost to recover a kind of catechumenate. I think Rod Dreher is is right when he says that we can't. We've lost the fight for the public space, and it'd be silly to pretend we haven't. Um, I mean, there might be pockets yeah. where we can regain something, but on the whole, what we need to do, I think, is to concentrate on rebuilding the church from the inside. Uh, and, and once we rebuild the church on the inside, people will start making their way there, as they always have done, if you like, in almost like a pre-Constantinian situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they'll come in as catechumens uh, and we'll have to cry. We'll have to say catechumens out because we're going to talk about sexuality and it's criminal. <laughs> so nobody who's not a baptized, paid up Christian can 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 listen because you made the nonsense to the authorities as they as as they did before and as persecution takes place. So I think. I think we may find the right model is the pre-Constantinian model of an underground church or a, a, a church that is discreet and for members only. Uh, yeah. And then from that position, evangelize. I don't, I think we have to start again and that may be the right model. Makes, yeah, that, it's, that's a, a scary thing to think about, but it probably will come to a point where that is the only option because you're basically going to be uh, imprisoned probably eventually if uh, if the trajectory continues the way it's going um, I mean I'm, never, I'm, I'm guessing everyone knows the um, uh, the, the Bishop of Chicago who uh, <laughs> about 10 years ago I've forgotten his name I'm really sorry he said, uh, I, I expect to die in my bed my successor will die in jail his successor will be martyred but his successor will play a part in rebuilding society around Christian principles as we always have done. Yeah, so, I think you know, that was Cardinal we're, George. Yeah. Cardinal Francis Cardinal George. George. Yes. Yeah. 
a very good man. I, I'm not a huge fan of his successor, though, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is slightly ironic for what he for, for that statement. But um, yeah, indeed. Well, it's just playing out, though, isn't it? I mean, we're you know we're halfway between the dying in bed and dying in prison bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's it's definitely maybe maybe the next one's the one di uh, dying in prison and the uh, I mean. Yeah, I guess it would make sense that the next one. So he's he's off by he, uh, Colonel George was off by one probably. Um, well, he was it, he was yes. We can't expect <laughs> we, must, we mustn't hold profits to too tight a time scale. I know. Yeah, no, I know. I just think it's funny uh, to to think how it how it plays out like that. But uh, yeah, no, it it's definitely this growing battle that I've seen and really the thing that has destroyed or has slowly decayed our culture is compromise. And everyone fights back when you try and kill everyone. I mean, that's why sort of, you know, like that's why the Soviet Union collapsed is because when they decided uh, they wanted everything right away to be done the way they want it to be done, you know, then they had to kill everyone because otherwise that wouldn't uh, happen. You know, the French Revolution was very much similar to that. So if it appears like compromise, people are much, much more willing to go along with it. And that's really what culture has become. Culture is a compromise to to appease those who want something. But as people get even greedier, as they uh, can, you know, try and comp want much more than is compromisable, you know, it seems that there's comes a backlash. But yeah, um, so it has been lovely talking to you, uh, Gavin Ashenden. It has been lovely. Uh, so I know you have now a podcast with the Catholic Herald. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it's rather exciting, and it's, it's part of the project to to uh, <clears throat> um, to bring the fight back to the Catholic Church in England. So the people uh, in, in charge of the Herald, uh, which is the conservative traditionalist periodical, um, there's a liberal one called the Tablet, but uh, we don't need to give them any more publicity. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're looking to try and ex expand their influence, and one of the ways of I used to podcast for the BBC, and they very kindly given me a platform to do that for the Herald. So. Uh, uh, so that happens uh, most weeks, and I also write write for the magazine. And then it would be marvelous if any of your listeners subscribe to the Catholic Herald, because that will, that, you know, that's that's how it survives and uh, and uh, to help it flourish. That would be the, one of the most important things that people could do. Um, and uh, I have a YouTube channel of my own where I offer uh, catechesis as I have, and I have a few thousand followers, not not many, but but. Uh, it, it works for some people. Um, uh, so, and, and a website where I, I put the things that I write. So, those are the three ways in which I try and uh, bring whatever influence to bear I, I can. Yeah, I will have those links in the description so people can check them check them out. Um, uh, please you. like, share, and subscribe follow Gavin and uh, you can hear more from him and uh, read what he writes. And he is just a great leader, I think on not just on, you know, an English scale, but a international scale. Uh, I, I always think that Americans like listening to uh, British people. <laughs> well, we, we've developed a degree of um, cosmetic authority in the way we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, I'm not sure it's always deserved, but you've been very complimentary and generous to me. So I'm, I'm. It's very kind of you. Thank you very much indeed. No problem. I like. I'm, I'm just thinking of the Crown, like Downton Abbey. You know, all these different things. It seems to me that the uh, culturally speaking, so certain Americans have a fascination, and maybe. Well, we 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 repay the compliment by being astonished at at at. Um, all the uh, the vigor of American culture. So I mean, American culture has has swept through Europe. Um, we're uh, meaning that a lot of what we do is really is is mere nostalgia now. Um, but uh, so uh, it's it's quite pretty nostalgia. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Anyway, so uh, so you have European nostalgia and American vigor. Yep. Well, we apologize for the vigor. Um, <laughs> uh, we apologize for not for not putting more content in in the nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. Thank you for coming on. And uh, for, again, please like, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Bye.